Maybe we can get started. So we're headed for an exciting afternoon, a stimulating afternoon session on brain stimulation and monitoring. And we're going to make a journey um, from the cortex with Dr. Morell to the anterior thalamus, John Archer, to seizure dynamics with Dean Freestone, implantable devices by none other than the illustrious Mark Cook. And then Patrick Kwan will come in full exercise regalia for Fitbit epileptology. <laughs> so um, if Dr. Sandler would come to do the introduction first, Roman Sandler. Very good, please, for Dr. Morell. Dr. Morell has been the chief medical officer at Neuropace and a clinical professor of neurology at Stanford University. She has been actively involved in helping to bring new therapies to patients. Her responsibilities at Neuropace include all clinical and preclinical research for a novel responsive neurostimulator for the treatment of medically uncontrolled epilepsy. She's an elected ambassador for epilepsy of the International League Against Epilepsy and received the American Epilepsy Society's 2007 Service Award for Outstanding Leadership and Service. Dr. Morell. Well, you'll see I can't remember my password, so that could be a problem. <laughs> I remember it. Um, thank you so much. I, um, this is really, I have always wanted to come and hang out with these Melbourne guys um, because of the quality of their work, and I respect them so much. And uh, they're a lot of fun, and apparently I get to go out to dinner with them tonight, so that'll be great. Um, but I have been asked to speak about um, what I've been involved with, with responsive neurostimulation. And over the course of the last few days, I've been changing my slides because I've learned a lot. Um, and I think maybe we can start to provide partial answers to some of the questions that have come up in the seizure prediction uh, workshop the last three days, but also um, and even more importantly to me, I have some questions that I'd like to put to you. Um, but just to put some context, the RNS system is an implantable responsive neurostimulator uh, that was approved by FDA uh, for medically intractable epilepsy. Um, the um, uh, clinical program um, lasted 10 years. Uh, there were 256 patients implanted and at this point. Uh, the average patient's been followed for six and a half years. And we have more than 1,600 um, implant years, uh, patient implant years of experience. Um, to, to just um, give you an idea of what this device is, um, it's all contained within the head. Um, a tray is made, is placed within a full thickness craniotomy, and then the neurostimulator, which has a battery integrated circuits, connector assembly, sits in that tray. Um, and it's connected to two leads. Uh, each lead has four electrodes, and they're placed according to the seizure focus. Um, the nurse stimulator is sensing from those eight electrodes at all times, and when it detects a pattern that it has been told is significant, as you can see in the green here, or in, just before the green, it delivers a stimulation in response. Um, it is the most complex biomedical device that exists as of today. But it is not intelligent in that the physician tells it what to detect and the physician tells it what to stimulate. Um, so it, and it will do so reliably. <coughs> um, the interaction the physician has with the device is once a patient is implanted and, and being uh, treated, the uh, data is collected. I'll show you how that is. And then the physician is able to review the electrocorticograms You'll see an example of three types of electrocorticograms that the patient might uh, come back with. And using the skill that, uh, um, uh, that EEG uh, people, um, like epileptologists, have, will identify those patterns that are typical of the interictal activity that often precedes the seizure. Um, and we have had conversations the last few days about when a seizure is fully developed, it's, you can't stop it. And so we learned that. We learned that, in fact, this is a neuromodulatory device and that you intervene when the system starts to become perturbed. Um, detection is programmed specific to that act activity. And then um, once detection is optimized, 
the loop is closed and stimulation is enabled. Um, and then the patient comes back, and this takes a while, um, uh, every three months for about a year to adjust detection and stimulation settings. Now, um, the system um, begins with the implanted components. Um, there is a physician programmer which is used to uh, tell the device what to detect and what to program, but um, the, the big piece of this that's turned out to be very powerful is the information that comes from the neurostimulator. The neurostimulator provides information on all detections, all stimulations, um, and also samples of the electrocorticograms <coughs> for the physician to review. And that's all sent to this patient data management system, which is um, it's sent uh, through the internet to secure servers. Um, the patient has a remote monitor, and they can interrogate their device and send that information as well. So it's like the library. All data on an individual patient is securely stored, accessed by the, by the healthcare provider through a password, and they can review everything that's ever been collected from the patient, simulate it, uh, uh, analyze the data in different ways. It's, um, uh, it's really quite a resource. Now, um, when a patient is identified who's a candidate, uh, the first step is to decide where to put the leads. And um, right now, the neurostimulator can be attached to two leads, um, each lead, as I mentioned, having four electrode contacts. Um, but it is very often the case that more than two leads will be implanted, um, with the, uh, leaving the option of um, uh, changing connections of leads if the detection and stimulation um, response isn't as, as desired. But the, we have had patients implanted every, everywhere in the brain. Uh, here you'll see an example of a, a patient um, with a neocortical epilepsy implanted with strip leads. A uh, patient uh, implanted, um, get this arrow working, lateral temporal. Very common implant strategy is um, hippocampal depths here uh, le right and left. Um, here you see the longitudinal picture. Um, patients have been implanted in periventricular nodular heterotopias. And we've had patients who have had epilepsy surgery who have been implanted uh, in the contralateral temporal lobe or even in what is left of the resected temporal lobe. Um, the kinds of recordings that are obtained are uh, very beautiful because uh, there's no muscle or movement artifact and no 60 hertz interference. And so this is the type of data the physician reviews on the programmer or on the patient data management system. And this illustrates the concept. So. Um, I'm a doctor, my patient's been implanted, my patient has bilateral hippocampal epilepsy, there's a de depth lead in the left and the right hippocampus, and they come back, and I look at this. Um, and I uh, can say, all right, well, this is the start of an electrographic seizure, so I would like to detect this kind of activity and intervene there. And here's uh, the onset of a seizure on the right, and I would like to detect and intervene here. And I'll make a point that, um, that for an individual patient, the seizures look the same. So once you've seen that left hippocampal seizure, they're all going to look the same. Um, but then I also may say, but I'm not sure I like these high amplitude spikes, and I'm not sure I like this lower amplitude rhythmic activity. So um, I may choose to uh, detect and stimulate into this and to this, but I may also tell the device, but you know what? Detect here and let me see what's going on. I don't want to stimulate it, but I want to detect it because I want to see if that's something that I should be treating. Um, so the clinician will review these saved ECOGs and identify the patterns, um, and then select the detectors. Um, the detectors in the neurostimulator, there's three, um, and they were selected because they are computationally very efficient, um, therefore require low power. Um, line length, area, and bandpass detectors, and they can be used alone or in any combination, and they've turned out to be highly effective. Um, and I mentioned there's four different detectors, uh, individual detectors that can be set. Um, in addition, the patient can uh, trigger storage of an ECOG by swiping a magnet over the neurostimulator. Here's an example. Right here, the patient has swiped a magnet and the uh, neurostimulator has saved uh, the ECOG uh, for a pre-specified uh, uh, time beforehand, in this case 40 seconds, 
and um, it, it, it's obvious here that there, there was a seizure. And then we've discovered that there probably are uh, biomarkers or disease proxies that are very powerful from the neurostimulator, and here's one of them. Um, obviously, the neurostimulator does not know if the patient's had a clinical seizure. There's no video with this. This is gathering electrical data. But when you see something like this, um, this is um, something that the, um, has been detected because the activity has gone on for a long period of time. And the physician will say, notify me or identify or save any episode that lasts longer than five seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds. In this case, the initial detection is made here where it says A1 at 30. And um, this patient's not being treated, by the way. And so at 60, it's, it's identified here that it's going to save this because it's a long detection. Um, and this is an electrographic seizure. Here you see um, the, uh, the display is also available in a spectral array. And I'll look at this. I mean, these, these seizures are astonishing. It's almost like a tuning fork is hit, where um, the, you see these, these harmonics um, in, the, uh, in the spectral frequency. So um, many um, physicians are feeling that counting these um, is information about the uh, quantitative information that may be very uh, complementary to what the patients are bringing in in their patients uh, in their paper seizure diaries. Um, so uh, how we use this and what it means is something that uh, we are actively exploring. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep going. So once it's decided to enable stimulation, there's, there's lots of choices the physician has, maybe too many. Um, but um, the first is the stimulation pathway. Uh, so uh, the physician will determine which electrodes are anodes and cathodes, um, which electrodes to stimulate over. You can stimulate over one or all. The neurostimulator casing can serve as an indifferent electrode. Um, and, and so theoretically, then, you can control the volume of tissue that is affected by the stimulation. I said theoretically because there actually isn't a lot of literature about how much tissue is affected um, given certain charge densities and currents. We, that is an area of research that we are starting to conduct, but it's one that really um, we, we need to understand um, uh, pathways and um, uh, volume of tissue that's, that's activated when we provide stimulation. Um, the engineers that um, developed the neurostimulator didn't know what we wanted, so they just gave us everything. Uh, so there are four programmable parameters. You'll see them listed there, and you'll see what, what the neurostimulator can do. But to the right is what we did in the trial. Um, this had not been done before, so we had to pick a place to start. So we picked a place that, um, th where there was some experience, and that is uh, stimulation for uh, movement disorders for Parkinson's disease. Um, and so most patients um, received um, very low charge densities. Um, it, we discovered that short bursts, 100 to 200 milliseconds, uh, worked quite nicely. And we pretty much stuck with high frequencies. So. Um, Another question I have for everybody is what are we doing when we provide short bursts of high frequency? I think in most cases we're desynchronizing. Um, and um, and then, then the question becomes, well, for those patients who have not responded to the stimulation approach, what other uh, part of the um, capability should be explored? What if we went to low frequencies and longer durations and uh, stimulation approaches that might be in training as opposed to desynchronizing? Um, again, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep going. Another piece of information that has turned out to be very helpful is um, understanding the temporal dynamics of these events uh, that are being detected. Um, and so uh, the, the physician um, can determine uh, or can tell the, the neuro neurostimulator through the programmer or patient data management system, show me all the detections um, by hour of the day or by day of the month um, and show me every day for a month or every month for a year. 
um, or just show me certain types of detections. And anyways, what um, you see here in, in this illustration is um, a patient who appears to have an increase in detections uh, in the early morning hours. And here is a patient who over the course of a month appears to have um, a, a period of the month during which uh, detections are more active. Um, this is actually a woman who has um, a, a catamanial pattern and it's very reproducible month by month. Uh, we do find that most patients are more active in the uh, early morning hours, um, just before they awaken or shortly after they awaken. But when you see these patterns in patients, they are very consistent. And uh, many of the physicians using this have used this data to um, change the time of dosing of medications or the amount of, of dosing. Or if all of a sudden somebody who's been doing well, you look at this and they're having the detections have gone crazy, you can call them up and say, are you taking your medication? Uh, and the answer might be, oh, I ran out a few days ago. Um, so I mentioned that um, you know the key words are uh, individualized, personalized medicine. Well, this is this is pretty personalized um, because um, there is an iterative process to refine detection and stimulation for that patient. Um, and typically, what we uh, do is we start stimulation low and we adjust as needed. And we're really mostly working with current now. Um, we have not explored. Uh, particularly modifications in frequency, pulse duration, and, and pulse width. Um, I will mention that sometimes I, I get um, uh, criticized, kindly criticized, about um, the fact that we haven't done more work in exploring these other stimulation parameters. But a point I just want to make is that we completed 10 years of clinical trials to get regulatory approval. And what you do when you find something that works is you don't you don't experiment at that point because if you experiment and it doesn't work, then your technology is never, never approved and, and never available. But now is the time that we can start to do that. So just very quickly, the clinical trials um, for devices uh, as opposed to drugs, um, there's two trials that are done, a feasibility, which is a safety, and then pivotal, which is randomized, controlled. And then um, patients are followed for a very long time in device trials. So these two trials are two years. And then after they finished um, one, of, one of these trials, they transitioned into this long-term treatment study, which is another seven years. So that will end in 2000. Last patient will finish in 2017, but that's nine years of prospective uh, data on efficacy and safety. These are extremely expensive trials to do. Um, the patient demographics, I'm just going to point out a couple of things. Um, one is that um, the patients, um, they had to have a minimum of three seizures a month to enroll in the trial. You'll see that the mean was 34, um, but really the, the point I want to make is the range, 3 to 338. What does that mean? Well, that means we had a very heterogeneous patient population. They had focal epilepsy or they wouldn't have been in it, but some were frontal, some were mesial, and I, I believe that also when we combine people with lots of different phenotypes, we may blur the effect. We may not really be able to understand the effect. So another challenge is going to be to understand how to apply this technology in, um, in, in particular patient uh, subgroups. Um, I would also like to point out that um, that a third of these patients had already been treated with a VNS, a third had had a resective surgery, um, and most had been evaluated with intracranial electrodes to localize the seizure focus, but not all. Um, many were uh, felt to be localized <coughs> adequately uh, with non-invasive methods, and those were mostly mesial temporal. Now, um, in a regulatory study, you have to pick your endpoint before you know anything about it. Um, and so we said, well, we'll look at months three, four, five after implant, which were three of the four blinded uh, months, and we'll compare the, treat the reduction in seizures in the treatment compared to the sham. And um, so we made that endpoint. Uh, the, there was a significantly uh, greater reduction in treatment versus the sham group. But we also learned, which we didn't know before, that when you put electrodes in somebody um, they have a 25% reduction in seizures before you turn stimulation on. 
And, um, that, and so uh, we discovered that, and we also learned how long it lasts. So I'll show you the sham group. So it's still 25% at month three, and then it starts to wear off. So by the last month, they're starting to get close to their baseline, but they're still not there yet. On the other hand, the group who is receiving stimulation continue to get better every month. So we learned two things. One is that if you've got to compare the two groups, it's probably best to wait a little longer so that your sham group is not having their implant effect. And the other thing is that this gets better with time. And I'm going to, um, uh, I'm going to show you that right here if I can get this off. Okay, so um, this, um, most of this was actually published um, this uh, year in, by uh, Greg Berge in um, Neurology. It was the long-term effectiveness data. Um, but what you see here is an update of that, so it's an extra year of follow-up. Um, this shows the median percent change with um, the, uh, the uh, 25th to 75th, excuse me, confidence intervals. And then um, to your right, you see the responder rate um, with the um, confidence intervals. I'm sorry, this is 25th and 75th uh, percent uh, quartiles. So um, I th there is um, clearly this upward trend, and patients continue to get better uh, till really about three years. And then you still get a little bit of movement, but but you do not know at one year how well a patient is going to do. So there's um, some effective time, and people say, well, is this because you were getting better at using the device? And I would say to some extent, yes, but we're really quite impressed with the fact that um, there's some uh, effective neurostimulation that, that uh, emerges over time, and that's supported by the VNS experience, and it's supported by DBS of the thalamus. Um, the other I, I would like to point out is that um, this, this display, I think, is, is telling us about the important patients because the upper quartile of patients has an 85 to 100 percent reduction in seizures. Um, the bottom quartile is 25 percent to, to no response at all. And um, so an active area of research for us is understanding who the people are in the lower quartile and who the people are in the upper quartile because this patient selection is going to be very important. But for counseling patients, I think we can say pretty confidently that they can anticipate a responder rate in excess of 60% by year three. Um, quality of life, mood, and cognition are, are very important outcomes in this study, and uh, these have been published. I won't spend a lot of time, um, but this does appear to be uh, benign in that uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't adversely affect <coughs> cognition or mood. Um, and if you can, um, if you can um, stimulate in the mesial temporal lobe um, in patients with, with uh, mesial temporal seizures, they appear to have improvements in memory. Um, and the same when you stimulate in the frontal lobe um, for language. Um, safety. Um, so it, cognitively, this appears to be, to be okay. So what are the concerns about putting in a medical device? Well, there's two concerns. One is infection. I mean, that's, you, that's a big concern. And the other is hemorrhage from placing leads. Now, I will say that um, this device has only been used in comprehensive epilepsy centers. So we were dealing with very skilled neurosurgeons. Um, and the infection rate is about 3.5% every time the neurostimulator is inserted or um, replaced. Uh, neurostimulator replacement now is about every four years, but the next device, which should be approved in a year, will be eight years between replacements. These are all soft tissue infections, so we haven't had any infections of the bone or of the brain. Um, Implant-related hemorrhage, very very little, and because the neurosurgeons know how to put these electrodes in, it's not the first time they've done it. Um, and the stimulation is benign. The, um, you can crank the stimulation up enough so that some patients will have a perception, you know, in the motor area. They may feel a twitch in their finger or may see phosphines in the occipital cortex, but that's not how high you need to go therapeutically. So it's always programmed to a place where it's not perceived. Um, the um, SUDEP rate we're tracking um, with 1,600 patient years, we can, uh, we actually have pretty tight confidence intervals around the rate of 2.3 per thousand, so that certainly has not increased.
So questions um, for you guys. I'm going to try to, to add, actually, I think I can partially answer the first one. Can't answer the next two. Um, what about this experience of having the electrodes stimulating the brain over years? Um, where should we be placing these leads and what stimulation parameters should be used? I'm going to show you what we know about the first one. So um, this is published by Carl Soleil, oh, I don't have the reference there, um, in our group, um, looking at impedances. Um, this was in 188 patients with um, 802 days of follow-up. And what we found, uh, which is the good news, is that whether looking for uh, at depths or subdural electrodes, um, that impedance is stable over the long term. But what is of concern is that it's very unstable acutely. Um, and in fact, with the um, subdural leads, the impedance um, did not stabilize for um, three or four months. And uh, with the depth leads, it was uh, two to three months. So um, this manuscript has just been submitted. Um, this is um, a, an additional analysis of, uh, we, we uh, looked at total power um, over time. Um, you'll see this is going out uh, many months after implant. And um, this is um, showing the depth and the strip leads um, the, uh, with a 95% confidence intervals. And you'll see that um, things, there's some variability, but uh, there is stabilization, but that stabilization is not occurring in the um, uh, strip leads until you're out about five months and the depth leads out about three months. Um, and similarly for spike rate. So uh, particularly for the depth leads, the spike rate is elevated when you first implant these. And that does not stabilize again for a period of uh, several months. So um, what can I say about this? Well, that three to six month post implant period is certainly associated with changes in clinical seizures. Um, not just in the RN-assisted trials, but also in DBS uh, for the anterior nucleus of the thalamus and in ECOG power. Um, and I think we really have to consider uh, this, um, this, this time required for stabilization or the time sampling when we look at our data. Okay. Um, and then um, just a couple of other observations. This will be uh, presented at American Epilepsy Society. What can we know about the effects of antiepileptic medications? Um, well, we had 13 patients who, in, after they'd been, they were one year into treatment, so we knew everything was stable, and they were started on a new antiepileptic medication called Clobazam. So we looked at the three months before and the three months after Clobazam were started, and this was time when their detection settings were stable. Um, and we looked at a num number of quantitative aspects of the ECOG, and I'll just show you a couple of examples. Spike rate. These are the spike rates rate in one patient. Um, on each of four channels um, before in blue and after Clobazam. Um, and here another patient before and after <coughs> Clobazam. And here is for all of those patients looking at um, what happens after you started the medication. So um, a big drop in the spike rate, a big drop in power, and in the uh, lower frequencies and higher frequencies. So. Um, this, is, um, this is kind of interesting because it may be a way to assess a patient's response to a medication um, without having to wait the many months uh, for them to uh, show you what they're doing clinically. And then finally, um, a, a paper that was published this year uh, in Epilepsia on 82 subjects in the study who were implanted with bilateral mesial temporal lobe leads. These were all patients who had been evaluated and the sites felt that their uh, lateralization, whether they were one or two hippocampal onsets, uh, was not 100% certain, so they implanted them. Um, and the question was, um, what was the ultimate lateralization, and then how long did it take before you saw the first contralateral seizure in those who had onsets bilaterally? Um, and this, this is, um, this is the, the data. So first of all, in these patients where there was some question, 16% were found to have unilateral onsets, and these patients were candidates for epilepsy surgery, and they, had, they were not, the, the center did not feel comfortable. Uh, before. 
Um, 84% were bilateral. But in order to see that first seizure on the other side, on average it was 41 days, over 41 days, um, with a median of 13, but a big range from 10 minutes after the leads were implanted to over one year. And here you'll see the distribution of time to the first contralateral seizure. And um, I don't know what the, what the pattern is in Australia. When I started out um, in the, in a long, long time ago, we, it was not unusual for us to keep people in the hospital for two weeks, and if we needed to, we kept them for three weeks. Um, but now, uh, people are brought into the hospital uh, at, at Stanford, and they're withdrawn from their medications, and at the end of the week, you know, usually they have to go. If we're lucky, the insurance company will give us two. And this just suggests that, um, at least in, you know, ambulatory patients in their natural environment, um, that time sampling is not sufficient to know if somebody is bilateral in, in many, many cases. Um, and um, so I think uh, that this certainly does not replace uh, monitoring in an inpatient unit, of course not, but it may supplement information. Uh, it may provide <coughs> useful clinical information uh, in patients for whom the EMU has not um, given an answer. So um, to close, Brian said, you got to finish, and I just do my last slide. Uh, so we have here a first-of-a-kind device. Um, it's providing targeted, uh, responsive, closed-loop stimulation. Um, I think we've shown that um, there's acute and sustained efficacy, so that's good. Uh, it doesn't wear off. Um, it doesn't make many people seizure-free. 12% uh, of patients had one year or more of seizure freedom. Obviously, we want to do much better than that. Um, we did find that stimulation is well tolerated and the risks of the implant procedure are likely to be acceptable to most patients. Um, but um, there, is, there are huge opportunities going forward. Um, and one is to understand who are the patients who are most likely to benefit from this. And then there is um, an immense amount of work that needs to be done about what should be detected and how it should be stimulated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marty. That was wonderful. Um, we have a half an hour for questions at the end, but uh, just to tease you a little, how about one question now? Anyone? Yes. Hi. That was a great talk. Um, I was just wondering if you could comment a bit on how we might develop some of these stimulation approaches, particularly given your earlier remark that it made it sound like it would be very difficult to sort of change things up and, you know, get sort of regulatory approval. So I was wondering, is it possible somehow to be thinking about targeting mechanisms that cause seizures to terminate? And is there a way of actually stimulating the brain in a way that excites those mechanisms to actually kick in normally? Because perhaps seizures might be associated with the breakdown of those types of mechanisms. I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Well, one question um, that, that we have is whether the, the morphology um, of the electrographic discharge uh, frequency, amplitude, and such would provide information about how stimulation should be delivered. Um, and um, I, we talked before in the workshop, stay away from 50 to 60 hertz because that can cause seizures. But if you're less than that or more than that, it, it doesn't. Um, I would really like to see those patients who have not responded to short bursts of high frequency treated with uh, low frequency stimulation. Um, I think it may also depend on the underlying pathology, and it may very much uh, be influenced by the type of anti-epileptic drugs patients are taking. Um, if they're on drugs that block sodium channels and, and stabilize membranes, um, perhaps those patients are not going to respond to high frequency stimulation. Um, but um, uh, the patients who are on medications that act synaptically may do very well with high-frequency stimulation. Um, that's actually one hypothesis we have. So this is, an, uh, this is a, a situation, one of the many situations, where now that we have all this information from people, I think we need to go to the lab, and it's an opportunity to, uh, to do some fundamental <coughs> work, animal work to, uh, to address some of these hypotheses. Okay, thank you, Dr. Morell.